songs in Darwin's first book are in first person. Uh, we probably knew this. Um, so we might well imagine that there is a narrator, and we may as well call him Darwin for the sake of the talk. Um, although the lyrics are by various authors, it's evident that Darwin appreciated them enough to set and publish them. We can infer that he wanted to be associated with them. It doesn't seem likely that these were simply what Darwin had to hand. It's more likely that they were chosen for publication. We know of other songs that have been composed by this time which were not included in the book. Um, of course, it was not composed as a single entity, like a, a song cycle, but the songs have been organized into um, a structure, a narrative structure, and we have what would appear to be an apology, an argument, illustrations of that argument, a development of it, a kind of resolution, conclusion, and, uh, and afterward. And uh, this might be interesting to us as we go about appreciating this music. Um, I'd rather like to see whether the book could be performed uh, in one go as a song cycle. Um, we'll be doing something similar uh, later today. Not the whole book, but a uh, crazy. Um, we open on uh, song number one, Unquiet Thoughts. In Chris Goodwin's words, this is an apology for the book. The narrator comes to the conclusion that despite the intensity or perhaps the unpleasantness of what he has to say, um, the unquietness of his thoughts, um, he must express himself or face a kind of living death. This is a theme that uh, we'll come back to uh, later on. Um, but uh, while we're here, we have a lute and we have a very good singer. Let's hear the song and get into the, the spirit of the piece. <coughs> This is a very common trope in Elizabethan poetry. And very pleasingly, it's a trope that features throughout this book. We find it um, in, in song number nine, The Crystal Tears. The first verse is dedicated to floods of tears, and the second verse to burning sighs. And uh, very pleasingly, we find this at the end of the book, in uh, song number 20, Come Heavy Sleep. The lyrics ask us to close up these weary, weeping eyes that tear my heart with sigh swollen cries. So with these lyrics as bookends, um, we can look on the entire songbook as our passions of desire. We've been crying and sighing throughout. Um, for this reason, um, it, I would say that uh, Song Number 20, Come Heavy Sleep, functions as the book's conclusion. And with that in mind, Number 21, Away With These Self-Loving Lads, is best seen as an afterword. It's a, a light-hearted dismissal of the book's complaint. Um, it's sweet to think that Darland is directing it against himself could be taking himself with some of that uh, lawful merriment he was famous for. Um, to turn back to the structure of the book, 
We've had the apology, and now Dalman sets out his argument in the second song of the book, Whoever Thinks or Hopes of Love for Love. The argument is very simple. If you still imagine that love can be fed, I will show you otherwise. In my experience, love and fortune are unjust, fickle, you can't rely on them. Um, let's, let's hear it. Let's. Just deserves, reward for good service, and good fortune. Um, we can sum this up by saying that love for Dowland is most associated with being responded to lovingly, being treated with a kind of just concern. Um, I'll come back to this. Dowland goes on to illustrate his argument with the next seven songs in the book, which are all associated in some way or another with figures at court. Um, Queen Elizabeth was, as we know, symbolically associated with love. Elsewhere in Dowland, she's referred to as the only queen of love. As the Virgin Queen, she was supposedly above love and could therefore uh, command it. There's a, a rather good uh, exploration of this in an essay by um, Helen Cobb. Uh, and with this in mind, we can turn to another Dowland song, Time Stands Still, in the third book. Um, it's very likely that the subject is the queen. According to Matthew Spring, the song is a kind of icon of her, which, with uh, featuring Cupid, hovering up and down, blinded by her fair eyes, uh, fortune captive at her feet. In other words, Queen Elizabeth has it in her power to bestow all of the aspects of love, of just deserts, good fortune, and so on, that, that I mentioned earlier. So, the next seven songs in the book are complaints, specifically addressed to love, but more generally towards the Queen, who has this kind of metaphorical association. And these are um, number three, My Thoughts Are Winged With Hopes, John Such's Galliard. If my complaint, Degree Piper's Galliard, can she excuse the Earl of Essex Galliard, now I know I need to must part, Duc d'Anjou's Galliard, Dear If You Change, which Anthony Rooney has attributed to the Earl of Essex, and uh, Burst Forth My Tears. Um, this last doesn't feature a direct link, save that its subject is a shepherd, which associates it with Arcadia. Um, for those of us who are unfamiliar, Arcadia um, is an epic poem composed by Sir Philip Sidney with a strong pastoral theme. That's a kind of allegory of the court. Um, so uh, Arcadia was in circulation almost a decade before the first book was published. The political pastoral connection was quite strong. Um, interestingly, there's one other court figure who features in the book, but who isn't grouped here. We'll come to him later. The first four songs are, are galliards, which was Elizabeth's favorite dance. Um, Lucas Henning has a, a rather good video on YouTube exploring this connection. 
The theme of these uh, seven songs is unanimous. They're all complaints about love being rejected in various shapes and forms. Um, song number nine, Go Crystal Tears, shares this theme, so I include it in this group. Uh, it's almost scientific. Darwin has opened the book with his thesis that love is not fair, and now he gives us these examples to illustrate his point. He's really hammering the argument home. The next group of songs then, uh, songs 10 through to 16, develops his argument. They all stand in relation to love, either hopeful in love by stealing a kiss, flirting, speaking earnestly, being well-behaved against all the odds, um, or having been rejected, bleak, sarcastic, melancholic. Um, this, is, this is a praise of, uh, of these next songs. So we might like to read them as moving from hopeful courtship to rejection and despair. Um, it's interesting that while Dowland is famous for his intense chromaticism and dark black melancholy, in this book, these qualities only feature in one song, All Ye Whom Love or Fortune. Um, there are two songs in this set, songs 10 through to 16, um, which can turn watching uh, a sleeping lover. Notice that in number 10, those of us who have the lyrics, um, thinks they'll then by feigning sleep, the narrator playfully forbids himself to go with any further than a kiss. Um, in fact, we'll sing you through these two songs. Um, first of all, Things Stolen by Fame, number 10, and then a verse from number 13, Sleep Way With Thoughts. Um, 
Notice that um, in the second verse of uh, song number two, whoever thinks or hopes of love for love, which is Dowland's argument for the book, um, he dismisses those who think they can win love by desires hidden, that is, by concealing our lust, which is the subject of these two songs. It's as if Dowland is still keen to prove his argument. He's been very uh, scientific about this. So, the last part of the book offers us a kind of resolution. Um, with the songs 17 through to 19, Come Again, Sweet Love Did Now Invite, This Golden Locks, and uh, Awake Sweet Love Thou Art Returned. Um, many of us in this room, myself included, um, are probably guilty of confusing Come Again with Come Away. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, um, they're quite similar songs. In both, the narrator is asking his lover out. But, whereas the first is naively sweet, Come uh, away, come sweet love, the golden morning breaks. Um, come again is actually quite bitter. It ends exasperatedly with the line that Cupid himself cannot pierce his lover's flinty heart. Um, with, this is something that we often omit when we perform a song, I think. It points to a, a slightly cynical, but perhaps more mature acceptance of love's fickleness. So again, the placement of these two songs, um, come away and again, implies a progression. It suggests that the narrator has matured with experience throughout the book. Um, earlier on, I mentioned that um, there was another core figure in the book. This is Sir Henry Lee, who was the Queen's jousting champion. Uh, and song number 18, His Golden Locks, was performed at his retirement pageant in 1590. We might have assumed that he would have been grouped in with the other core figures earlier in the book. And the first seven songs of the book are all to do with Queen Elizabeth's court, and many of them are galleons, um, as uh, um, uh, his golden locks is, or at least uh, it's a trick galleon that starts out as well. Um, but this has evidently been vetoed. I can think of two explanations for this reason. Either it's because um, his golden locks is a retirement song, so it's fitting that it features at the end of the book, or it's because whereas the earlier nobility were complaining of unjust treatment by the Queen, Henry Lee is being rewarded by the Queen for his service. Either explanation supports the idea that there is a narrative at work within the book. And finally, we have um, number 19, Awake Sweet Love, which is about a loving reconciliation. So these three songs all contain, in a way, answers to the problem of love, which we've been debating throughout the book. So, to reiterate, uh, we have, in the structure of the book, an apology on quiet thoughts, an argument of the book, whoever thinks or hopes of love for love, illustrations of that argument, which are songs, my thoughts are winged with hopes, through to her crystal tears, a development of that argument, with uh, things style then, through to with my conceit, a resolution, come again, through to awake sweet love, a conclusion, come heavy sleep, and an afterword, away with these self-loving lads. And if we're aware of this structurally, um, it can help us to make interpretative decisions. You know, for instance, the come again is viewed through slightly jaded eyes. Um, so this is my first point in the book. Just as an overview, it seems to have a structure, and that might be interesting to some of us. Um, my second point is a little more um, speculative, uh, but I hope you'll bear with me. Um, I'd like to highlight three of the significant themes in the songbook. And these are watched sleep, life in death, and unfair treatment. Let's, let's look at these in turn. So, in this book, we encounter the subject of sleep six times. In uh, Go Crystal Tears, Things Tell Them, Come Away, Sleep Away With Thoughts, Awake Sweet Love, and Come Heavy Sleep. And in the first five of these, the narrator is addressing their lover, who is asleep. A sleeping lover is, by definition, ignoring our address, and so we find a clear association of sleep with rejection. In uh, song number nine, The Crystal Tears, it's the thoughts of my desert that sleep to sound, which the narrator is yearning to awaken. This is also the assumption made in Awake Sweet Love. It is love that has been asleep. Um, the second uh, theme, life in death. Here and elsewhere in Dalman, there's a preoccupation with a living death. Here it features in uh, Will Thou and Kind Thus Read Me, the line that life shall die, death shall live for to love thee. With my conceit, whose life is death. 
Come heavy sleep. My soul that living dies, Tukhan may be sung. Um, it's uh, also implied by the eclipsed overrun earth of uh, whoever thinks or hopes of love. And by the, the blind, mute, heartbroken state depicted in unquiet thoughts. That song makes clear that it's a repressed, ignored need for expression that begets this living death that is a preoccupation for death. And uh, unfair treatment, well, examples of unfair treatment by love are omnipresent in this book, as, we, as we've seen. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll read them as quickly as I can. Um, Whoever thinks or hopes of love, my thoughts are winged with hopes. If my complaints can she excuse, now I now burst forth my tears, all you whom love or fortune will come kind with my conceit come again. Um, <laughs> uh, exhaustively uh, unfair examples of uh, unjust treatment by love. Earlier on, I loosely defined this conception of love as being responded to lovingly. And it's the absence of this that is the preoccupation of the entire book. These themes, watched sleep, living death, unfair treatment, point to a figure who must express himself, but who is not being heard, who is being ignored by people in positions of authority or who are in a position to bestow love, bestow good fortune, and who are refusing to listen. It's um, a figure that I think runs very deeply in Dowland's psyche. Um, I think it's central to his self-conception. I think this underpins what Liz Kenny's called his anti-establishment isolationism, his disappointment in being denied a court position for Elizabeth, although he was being well paid elsewhere, and uh, his polemic in a pilgrim solace against a new generation we felt were ignoring his work. Personally, I think that this is at the root of Dowland's melancholy. I believe that his genius was driven by a profound need to be heard that was being uh, thwarted, at least for him. Uh, after all, there's no more central need for a musician to be heard, um, or indeed for any of us. So, those are my thoughts. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this talk, and if you have any thoughts, comments, or criticisms, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. and feisty with the rest of these court gallants and by the end of it you know we've come to a slightly more you know mature resolution with things so that's, that's what I was getting at there. I think there's another aspect I've been sort of looking into I think this is it's a wonderful thing that sort of gradually we've all lived with these songbooks so long as sort of you know, you're staring into the darkness and gradually things come out. And you've talked about Daniel's book of songs. Mm. And I think there's an interesting thing about the classical, the classical tradition, because Daniel's book of songs starts with a pagan invocation, intent invitation to sin, really, yeah. um, the, the story about Apollo and Daphne, and then uh, ends with a Christian reassurance that Anne Green remains a good girl. Ah, and you yeah. get the same thing in Rossiter and Rossiter and Dowling's 1600 book. Yeah. You start with, my sweetest days to be a letter's living up, which is Catullus. Yeah. So that's an invitation, a classical invitation to sin. Yeah. And then at the end, it ends with come. So there's the this, this so thread running of And there's a classical thing that's on a, a sapphic meter. Mm. 
with, and it's, uh, which was used by Horace for Integra Vitae, a famous moral poem. But um, so he started with invitation to Lesbia, mm. and then um, the, 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 and then um, uh, closing with a song in the meter of the poetess of Lesbia. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there's that. But uh, that's that's one of the influences is here, maybe. I, I mean, my perhaps I'm a problem in this because uh, she's a classicist. Um, but there's a Catullus strain, uh, sorry, a, a Propertius strain. Goes through. I think the sleep songs are based on a. Um, a very influential poem by Propertius mm -hmm. about a, a kind of man coming home late from his drunk from the symposium that his girlfriend mm -hmm. is asleep and he wakes her up and she gets very angry and says, Where the hell have you been? I'm not surprised. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, the sort of, and that's what um, uh, uh, the, uh, was it, uh, the famous Campion song about. Um, shall, I, uh, shall I come sweet love to the. No, no, the one that was the. Oh, oh it fell on a summer's day once. Yes, it fell on a summer's day. Yeah. There are actually two Latin versions of that. Actually wrote that as yeah. a smoking gun. It's definitely not how he thought of himself. He thought he wrote only I mean, written three poems. Right? He obviously thought it was a bit of a turn on. Yeah, absolutely. Well there's, there's, a, there's a big distinction though between the um, the Campion songs and and, and uh, Dowland's. You know, the uh, Dowland can be playful, but there's more urgency here. You know, um, yes. the Campion is much more sort of uh, whimsical. It's it's uh, quite sexually charged. These ones, you know, you get the impression that there's an ulterior motive going on, and I think that was what I'm interested in is, is the notion that what, what does this image symbolise? You know, it's it's a, a lover who is asleep who is ignoring our addresses. And I think that's, that's Darwin's preoccupation, rather than with, with, with Campion, where this is rather titillating and, and quite fun. But it's quite interesting, neat. it's the same. It's, it's all bit, yeah, it's, it's all the, same, the, the same, the same route, nice. yeah. But the other thing is, um, come away, come sleep up, the middle verse of that, mm -hmm. is again, I think, based on a poem by the Virgins, um, about um, naked, naked yeah, yeah. as being better than, you know, clothed, being clothed and so on. That should rise. And the way with yourself loving that, that's about Cynthia, who is the lover of yeah. So there's obviously a classical theme, and I'm sure there's more to be investigated in that. Really. Sure. So, um, anyway, it's, a thought. it's 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 an interesting thought, and I like the idea very much that there's um, you know that there's a thread running through these books that they're you know to the Renaissance mind this isn't just a, a, a compilation of songs. At least with some books we get that impression. Yeah. You know? um, but here you get the sense that there's a theme and that it's been compiled with something in mind, with with, with potentially an argument. As, as is uh, what I suspect of this book. Um, and I think that's very fascinating. So, did you say again about the period of change? I didn't quite hear what you said there. Oh, just that um, Tony's attributed that to the Earl of Essex. Oh, okay. So, I group it in with the songs which, you know, this is the songs at the beginning of the book, um, the, the galliards, the gallants, um, figures of Elizabeth's court who are. Um, very much uh, disappointed in uh, their favours by the Queen. Um, you know, the, the sense that she is this figure of, of love and good fortune, this deity who can bestow these things, but is choosing not to. And I think that this is, this is something that Dallin empathised with very much. Because I think that Tony noticed that the dear if you change, it's, it's an inversion of that idea. Yeah. So it's the world turned upside down. It's, mm. it, it, uh, you know, if the Queen stopped being constant, it will be everything, the whole world be chaos. Down made to shine as black as hell shall prove, yeah. Don't you see the same thing in the songs of the, towards the end of the third book, you may be very explicit about being badly treated, you know, the lowest treats have lost, yeah. what poor astronomers men are, that kind of thing. Well, yes, I mean, um, absolutely. I think this is a very common theme for Dowland. I think this is his central preoccupation, really. Um, the idea that I have all these wonderful things to say, um, I, you know, I have this music, um, I am not being listened to, I'm not being given my due, I'm being ignored <laughs> by the people who are supposed to be loving me. And this was something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And they bought that book, and then they reprinted it a few times. Yeah. They bought it, didn't Well, exactly. You know, he was, this is it. it never seems that it was enough for him. You know, he the was, grass he was, is always greener. <laughs> yeah, well, he was, this is it. He was world famous, he was being paid royally. You know, um, uh, for, for Christine of Denmark, um, you know, uh, and none of it was ever good enough for him. You know, he, he was constantly uh, laboring under the impression that he was being ignored, that that uh, um, that he was not receiving the love that was due to him, um, which is a sad thought and a melancholy one. You know, I, I really think this motivates the man. Um, so David Pinter suggested he said that. Uh, 
Darwin was living his life from a, 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 a call it a dog-eared script. It was, so the idea, somebody suggested that the, um, the dedication at the beginning of Lacrimae, whom fortune has not blessed, he either rages or weeps. But that seems like a graceless insult to patrons, because people were back in yeah. But if you, you uh, maybe, well, I said it's probably, I think it's more likely, instead of saying when they read that, that ungrateful cove down, yeah. all the money I've given him, I'm sure you were meant to say, oh yes, that down, melancholy type, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that was. Uh, absolutely, it. absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, it, was, it, was a, it, it was a pose, I think. Mm. Again, to, to, to it's like you might look at it, I started looking at classical pieces in Campion, and the saucy songs, the naughty songs, yeah. actually all come from Latin poems. Yeah. So it pushes him, in a way, it pushes him a bit further, pushes him a bit further in a way, because we don't really know. Can't get of course, chair, yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be just an elaborate pose. We, and we, some of the naughty songs in Campion are really just a literary exercise showing off to absolutely, the, the absolutely, yeah. So, but in a way, that brings them closer because yeah. what Campion's trying to do is uh, make down as well is reenact the music of the ancients, just like we're doing here today. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> which they were trying to recreate the music of the Romans and Greeks and yeah, the, 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 the tortoise shell of the yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yes. Um, no, I, that, that's a very good point. Of course, we can never, you know, we can never know. Um, but um, my impression of Darland is that um, I don't think it's entirely a pose. Um, I, I think, you know, I mean, uh, there's, um, yes, he's capable of, of um, playing a role, for sure. But I think that's at least founded in something very true. You know, I, I find it hard to believe um, speaking personally, that the man who composed In Darkness Let Me Dwell and Flow My Tears um, was not intimately acquainted with melancholy and really, really knew what it felt like. And then he says, if you enjoyed my songs half as much as I enjoyed writing them. You know, so he was... Yeah, absolutely. Was it Diana Paul's suggested? I can't remember who suggested it. Possibly part of the reason about Dowland, it may have been, we don't know much about his family, and maybe he didn't come from a posh family. Maybe he had a chip on his shoulder, he didn't. He was a self-made man, yeah. and actually, I think um, Thea Abbott, uh, David Bernard's part, was saying she thought Julian Bream might have been a little bit like that as well. Oh, and that's interesting. On the shoulder. And now so we, we continue with our, 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 our reincarnation of, uh, yes. of Dowland through Bream. Um, you know, much much like these, uh, um, you know, pale-skinned. Um, uh, melancholics clad in tight black clothing, you know, starting with John Donne and, you know, carrying on through emo rock. Um, but, um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> um, I think that's the argument of unquiet thoughts, isn't it? You know, I have to create this stuff, no matter how unpleasant, murky, and uh, uh, angry it is. <laughs> exactly, speak then and tell these passions, because the alternative is that you're going to be, you know, deaf, mute, dumb, and you know, very sorry for yourself. I'd like to propose that he can't have been unhappy if he wrote such beautiful music, mm. the lute and the singing all the time. Well, there is that argument. Um, but then perhaps the reason it is so beautiful is because he was so aware of the sadness. You know? There's um, that saying that none know uh, joy so much as the melancholy. It's the, the, the Democritus paradox. Uh, Democritus, this great uh, stoical philosopher who was incredibly cheerful because um, he was constantly saturating himself with the misery of life. Um, you know, he was so thoroughly aware of all the bitterness, the sadness, the nastiness, the fact that nothing is ever going right, that in the end, you arrive at a place of enjoying all the good things when they come. You know how to see them with their value. You know? um, I, th I think this is true of Darwin. We know that he lived his life in lawful merriment. Um, I think there's an argument that he was able to find joy because he was so acquainted with, with the darkness. So that at least would be my take. Why do, why do we have any ideas about why he stopped writing later on? 
do, do you have any thoughts on that? Why he started in his last 15 years, ago. I didn't write him, it was 14 years, I didn't write him. I personally never thought. considered that. Yeah. Um, like like Leighton, actually. Who, Did he? Was know. it because things were going to a bit more money? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Once he got the middle room, we're going like, uh, like Orsini, you know, retiring to bed and eating good food for the rest of his life. I mean, we just, we just got out. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. I've done all the sad stuff. Now I'm, I'm contented. I don't need to do anything. I, I quite like that. Although, I mean, you know, <laughs> if, if I'm not sure I'll ever be able to retire, but I'll let you know if I get to that age. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm done. Um, that's a very good thought. I, I, I honestly haven't considered um, what would have prompted it's that. You know? he, he does say, you know, he lacks the skill now. Um, in the preface to Pilgrim Solace, he says he lacks the, um, the facility to play. Um, and he wanted the younger generation to go and fight for him. Um, it's hard to say, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and um, Robert Dowden says in 16, uh, he is singing towards his end. Mm -hmm. Like a swan yeah. sings towards his end, but he was nowhere near his end. He lived another 15 years. <laughs> maybe he was uh, getting yeah. ready for it for a long time. Maybe um, arthritis. Well, well, maybe he had, yeah. Well, I mean, possibly he was one of these people who started to leave through his son. That's a really good point. Um, and, and the musical banquet, you suspect that he may well have been involved in this. So maybe he felt that he'd been a major, but here was his son, and, and he was perhaps trying to push, push, push his, his work at the expense of his own, own reputation. Son, yeah. And of course, his son then succeeded him, mm -hmm. uh, caught when he died. His son took the place, post. And, That's uh, a really so good point. So in a way, he handed the baton on. But I mean, just like some parents trust, you know, they, they haven't quite made it, so they then Absolutely, yes. Legacy um, and about Robert. That's a, that's a good call, I would say. Well, Michael Gale suggested he probably living in the way, the way he was at Fetter Lane, mm -hmm. just next to the Interport, he's probably doing lots of teaching. That's another possibility. And well, he's that's, really doing that. that's and some playing jobs at court. And that was, mm -hmm. that was so by the end of it, he did. Lost his fire for composing. We, well, we don't know. Well, we've got a bit of. Is that, is that any more? Do you have any more questions? Oh, well, thank you very much. It's been a Thank you all.